going to share several passages of Scripture this morning. Um, I'll be sharing from Jeremiah 2, and then Hebrews 12, Hebrews chapter 12. But in 1992, uh, I met Pastor Sleva, and we met him at the church in Cincinnati. And most of you have met Pastor Sleva. He's visited our church here. And in 1992, when I met Pastor Sleva, at that point, he was a fairly young man. He was in good health. He had two young sons and a beautiful wife. And things seemed to be going very well for him. And, uh, and most of you know his story. He suffered much loss of his health, of one of his sons, and much suffering. But he writes a blog, which is called The Healing Page. And from time to time, I go there and read the things that he's written. And this week, he posted something, and I just wanted to share a short writing that he had posted on his blog. And it says, Today, I need him again. I can't do it myself. Some folks are intellectually brilliant. They depend on this. Some are physically endowed. This helps them. The third group have wealth. They turn to it. Others cope well. I also had the traits of mental skill, some muscle too, some savvy, and a good income, a great wife. The problem is the famous verse, God helps those who help themselves, cannot be found in the Bible, even with a diligent search. God helps those who help themselves. You ever heard anybody say that? Because the reality is, is that we need God. And the belief that we are self-sufficient isn't something new. And as we look into Jeremiah 2, we're going to see the prophet lamenting over a nation that believed that they didn't need God. Seems like much like our nation today. I would say as Christians today, people who believe that we rely on God, we are very definitely a great minority in this day and age. But in Jeremiah 2.11, reading from verse 11, Hath a nation changed their gods or traded their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have traded or changed or traded their glory for that which does not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye yet desolate, saith the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me for the they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They have committed two evils. First, in forsaking God. And then the second evil is in turning to something else that cannot supply. How often do we do this? And you see, not all godless people seem bad. You may meet someone who seems like they are on top of the world. I can remember working with a lady who said, you know what, I haven't made. I haven't made. Me and my husband both have great paying jobs. <coughs> she says, I love my job. We have a good time. We travel whenever we want. We have everything in life that we ever need. And within a year, she had died of breast, breast cancer. You see, we can trust in things. And they're nothing but cisterns that are broken, that cannot hold water. You see, not all godless people seem bad, but it's just that they don't commit their lives to God. And they have some reasons. They consider being freelance as an advantage. You know what? I'm free to do whatever I, I want. Um, they, they consider being godless in practicality, an advantage. Why do I need to believe in God? 
You know, they believe it gives them more time. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to spend time doing this. But why should or why do I need God? And this is where we turn to Hebrews 12. And I'm going to read 14 through 17. And I may read it from a couple different versions. But there's one version that I read, one translation, that I think really brings this out good. Hebrews 12, verse 14. Per- Pursue peace with everyone as well as holiness. And what did we say holiness last week? We talked a little bit about holiness being set apart uh, unto God without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up and causes you trouble or many of you will become defiled. No one should become immoral or godless like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. You see, it refers to Esau as someone who is godless. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected because he could not find any opportunity to to repent, even though he begged to repent with tears. And I want to say something. It's not that he couldn't repent, but what it is is that He has established himself in a way of thinking with a hard heart. And he's seeking a way to get out of the consequences of something that he had already made a decision on. He wanted his birthright and blessing after the fact that he sold it for a bowl of beans. Then he wanted it afterwards. Of course, he would have wanted to change at that point. But he's wanting relief from consequences. So it sounds surprising when you think that all godless people don't seem bad. You know, they don't seem bad at all. They seem like eh, pretty good people sometimes. And they may live even somewhat of moral lives. But they won't commit their lives to God. And here are some of the reasons, like we, we touched a little bit. They consider themselves practical people. I'm a practical person. I believe in science. I don't believe in this stuff that you can't see. Then the more you hear about science, the more you see that people are really believing in things that they don't see. But they consider themselves practical people. And they have more time to spend for themselves because they don't have to come to church. They have more freedom to do whatever they want to do. Because they don't believe in a God who has established a moral code for them to live by. They can spend extra time on their pleasures. And there's no conscience to bother them if they commit anything against morality. Because after all, the ethics of a godless person are typically situational or comparative. You know, I'm better than so-and-so, so I must be okay. Well, I would have never stolen this except I really needed the money. And it wasn't really stealing because I just cheated the company or the government out of it. And it didn't really affect any single person. You see, these are the ways that a godless person is free to think. And this is the type of person that Esau was. So let's read a little bit about Esau. It says, make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau. He traded his birthright as the oldest son for a single meal. So Esau, he's been called by the Bible as godless. But he may not, and and I don't know since I never saw him, but he made him not seem like a bad person because when you listen, when you read the Bible about him, he might be like who, your neighbor today. He was, seemed to be a good son. His father loved him dearly. He was actually the preferred son of his father. Not like that swindler Jacob, right? <laughs> he was up to a point a good brother until he was really put to the test. And he may have been a good citizen, but he was called godless because he decided To live without God. Esau was self-sufficient. He could carry himself alone. He was a hunter. He probably was physically strong. And had a brave heart. 
He went out into the wilderness and he hunted. His own ability to live without help from others made him decide to live on his own. And although he had a godly heritage, think of his heritage. He had a grandfather who has been called the father of faith, who was Abraham. He had a father who was highly favored by God, who was Isaac. He had a brother who has been blessed by God, who is Jacob. But we don't see a single time when Esau prayed or worshipped or built an altar to the Lord of his fathers. None at all. There's nothing recorded ever of him acknowledging God in any way. So based on the scripture that we're reading today, let's see why we need God in our lives, each and every one of us individually. As a nation, believe me, we need God. But we need God individually in our lives rather than being godless like Esau. Because Esau is a mirror of many people today. And it just merely simply means him being godless, that he doesn't have God in his lives. Many people today does not have God in their lives. And they're motivated by a love for this world. Don't care about spiritual, eternal future. Don't care about God. Don't care about spiritual ways. Don't care about their soul. A godless person doesn't worry about these things. And how many times when I've talked to someone about their eternal soul, that they would say, look, when I'm dead, I'm just dead. And that's all. There's nothing else. I'm just dead. Many people have said this to me. I, it's, a, it's a sad thing to be so, so wrong about. But they don't care about their soul. Godless people are like wandering sheep in the desert without a shepherd. And this is the first reason why we need God. Because a person without God is like a wandering sheep in the desert without a shepherd. They want all the freedom to do what's pleasing in their eyes. They don't want a master to tell them what they should do. They hate the idea of keeping any divine laws. So they reject the idea of having a God who must be followed. So how does a sheep fare in the desert? You see, sheep are not the smartest creatures out there. And sheep will get themselves in places they can't get out of. They will push themselves into a, a patch of thorns and get stuck or halfway through a fence and be stuck. And the shepherd has to come and pull them out or rescue them because they will wander around and get into all kinds of trouble. And that's what we're like in that we get ourselves in all kinds of trouble. People who are godless are vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. Sheep are defenseless. They don't do a very good job of defending themselves, especially domesticated sheep. Even domesticated cows, if you ever look at them, they don't look like the smartest things around. And they will stand, you will have a bunch of them stand and watch as a wild animal eats one. And it's like, run, run, get away. <coughs> and they can't even bring themselves to defend themselves or to act wisely. Vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. They have no shepherd to protect them when the beast of the field attacks. And they are helpless and powerless without the hedge of God's protection. You see, God hedges each and every one of us about. Pastor Stevens taught a message on the hedge of God. And that there are multiple hedges around us. One being the church that we are in is a hedge of protection for us. The grace of God is a hedge of protection around us. And like the sheep, we can break through these hedges, but the wild animals and the serpents are there waiting for us if we break through the hedge of God's protection. So using the life of godless Esau, let's see the second reason why we need God in our lives. The person without God makes wrong decisions. And you know what? I make wrong decisions anyway, but especially if you don't have God in your life, especially in spiritual things, 
we will make wrong decisions. What was the wrong decision that Esau made? He traded his birthright, verse 16 in Hebrews 12. He traded his birthright right, as the oldest son for a single meal. You might think, that is absolutely ridiculous that he would trade an enormous amount of wealth. And he had convinced himself, well, I'm about to die, and so it might be better. He chooses the wrong priority. He's interested in only what can satisfy the longing of his flesh. He cares only for his stomach, and he doesn't care for the things that will please God. Where's Esau's attention? It's focused entirely on the things of the world. In Hebrew legend, Esau came to be looked upon as the entirely central man, the man who puts the needs of his body first. Jacob and Esau, you know, one of them was, as you look at the two of them, is that there were two worlds before them. The world, this world that we presently live in, and the world to come. And Jacob said, I will take the world to come. And Esau, perfectly happy just to accept this world. Why? Because he never didn't even believe that there was any other and that was his belief. Esau's a picture of a person who decides to choose the wrong pleasure. Instead of delighting himself in the Lord, his heart has been snared by his worldly appetite. No hunger for righteousness, only a desire for the pleasure of this world. But the Bible advises God's people to... Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires and the secret petitions of your heart. You see, that's twofold there. Not only does he make your heart desire the right things, but then he will fulfill those things that your heart desires. Another verse, Matthew 6, 33. He will give you all you need from day to day if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. That's Matthew 6, 33. Now, let's look at another reason why we need God. In Hebrews 12, 17, afterward, he, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. He threw out his spiritual blessing for the sake of his physical need. He traded his eternal inheritance for temporary pleasures. He fed the hunger of his flesh, but ignored the longing of his soul. When a man or a woman throws away their divine inheritance, they throw away all eternal hope. And that's what Esau did. Matthew 8, 36 says this, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life in the eternal kingdom of God? What does it profit us? What did it profit Esau? He became very, very wealthy. After Jacob had left and came back, there was an extreme amount of wealth that belonged to Esau. And... What does it profit him today? Now, one last reason why we need God. The person without God brings heartaches and troubles to his own life. In Hebrews 12, 17, it was too late for repentance, even though he wept bitter tears. Why is it too late? In other words, what it's saying, it's not too late for him to say, I'm sorry, but it's too late to change the situation in that now the consequences of his choice are there for him. It can't be undone. It's kind of like the saying of the guy who gets intoxicated and gets in his car and drives and he hits someone head on and there's a mother and child in the car and the baby is killed. He can repent and the mother may even forgive him. But what about the baby? The baby is still dead, right? The consequence of his sin and bad choice is still there. 
and it's a consequence that is not undone. That is what Esau is struggling against. He has brought heartaches and troubles into, its own li- into his own life, and it is too late to change, even though he wept bitter tears. And you see, people without God make those wrong decisions, and they bring troubles and problems into their own lives. So many people today are suffering the effects of a godless life, and you don't have to look very far to find them. And I'm going to close with this. I'm going to give reasons. I'm going to itemize some reasons why we need God. Why do I need God? I need God because he's the source of spiritual life. He is the only source of spiritual life. What did it say when we, we read in Jeremiah? They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. They have forsaken me. Water is a symbol for life. And what did he say? They traded me for these cisterns that can't hold water. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus brought God's message of living water. John 4, 10 and 11. And we're talking about the woman at the well. This woman was living in self-sufficiency without the life of God within her. She recognized her own need and was filled with great joy to believe in the Lord. John seven thirty eight. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, Streams of living water will flow from within him. And then finally, Revelation 7, 17. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We need God because he is the source of spiritual life. We also need him because I cannot manage my life alone. I need someone who has more wisdom than me, that I can draw upon this eternal wisdom. Someone who has been here from the beginning and will be here to the very end, that I can draw upon their wisdom. My knowledge is inadequate. I need someone who is wiser than me. My perception of life is limited. I need someone who knows the past, the present, and the future. What do I see? I only see a very short amount of the past and then this exact time. What about the one who stands outside of time, who transcends time, who sees the beginning and the end, standing here looking at it like I look at this pew? I can see that end of this pew, and I can see this end of it. And that's the way God looks at time. He sees the beginning, and he sees the end already. Is it any wonder that his wisdom is more than enough for me to draw on? You see, people, God's people, don't need to commit murder or adultery or become a thief. But we are godless just by default. Because we were born into this fallen world. And if we have not accepted Jesus Christ and committed our lives to him, we're still living as godless people. God has an invitation to all people, and it includes each and every one of us as we read his writings. Revelation 3.20 says, I am standing at the door and knocking. If anyone listens to my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And we will dine together. And then John 1.11. Still many people ignore God. He went to his own people. And his own people didn't accept him. So let's keep this in mind. As we, I, I believe probably everyone here born again. And has already made God your source. And realize your need for God. But we're going to meet many people in the world on a daily basis that do not know the things that we have talked about this morning. And let's be equipped to share with them. Or there may be 
categories in my life that I have not submitted to God, that I'm not being led by God, and that I am walking in darkness. But I need God in this specific application in my life.